Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Josh Valentine. I'm the communications manager for the Clean Coalition. Uh, you are attending another Peninsula Advanced Energy Community webinar. It's a series of webinars that we've been doing the next for the for the past couple of months, and we have a number of uh, more webinars coming up in the next few months. Uh, this one, innovative approaches to energy efficiency retrofits. Uh, we will be uh, joined by representatives from San Mateo County Office of System Sustainability. That would be Kim, Kim Springer, Rachel Launder, Andy Jane, and from Design Avenues Ed, and Administer. Before we begin, just a few technical aspects you should be aware of. Um, the webinar recording and slides will be sent to registers attendees within two business days. All webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org and the Clean Coalition's YouTube channel. Um, if you have a question, uh, we will do our best to answer uh, a number of the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so type those into the question box on your control panel and go to webinar. And if you have any other questions for me, technical or otherwise, please email me at josh at clean-coalition.org. Once again, our speakers for today, Kim Springer, Rachel Launder, Andy Jane from San Mateo County Office of Sustainability, and Ann Edminster from Design Avenues. So we have a lot to cover today, so I'm gonna pass it off to Rachel and she's going to go through uh, their presentation. So hello everybody, this is Kim Springer from the County of San Mateo Office of Sustain Sustainability. And I um, want to make sure that everybody can hear me, and uh, we'll go on with the presentation. Uh, today we're talking about innovative approaches to energy efficiency uh, retrofits. And I want to start with talking just a little bit about the Office of Sustainability, um, Count of San Mateo. It's just a couple of years old. And uh, just a little brief about the scope of work for, um, that we're doing for the Advanced Energy Community Project. And then we'll go into the presentation. So the county's Office of Sustainability has four different working groups, um, climate change, energy and water, livable communities, and waste reduction. Um, each of those programs have multiple um, sub-programs, so the different groups have different sub-programs. And our focus is really solving for tomorrow um, through collaboration, engagement, and education. Um, the particular group that I uh, oversee is called the Energy and Water Programs Group. Uh, we have a San Mateo County Energy Watch, um, the Bay Ren Energy Upgrade Program. Uh, we have a groundwater, a stormwater, and a water conservation program as well. And we do dabble in uh, EV charging and uh, various other things as well. But these are the main programs. Um, lease language was a, you know, in terms of our uh, scope for the Advanced Energy Community Project. We have a fairly small scope, um, some of which you'll be hearing about today. I, I think in a, in a larger way, we were kind of a connective um, group to help uh, the Clean Coalition and the other partners get connected to other folks and stakeholders. And that's, uh, again, that's another role that we play as a convener for the Office of Sustainability. So the main um, challenges, I'm sure you're all aware, um, uh, is the split incentive issue around lease language. Um, it is an issue, but I also believe that it's an opportunity. And uh, sort of a straight definition is that uh, when a building owner or landlord implements capital improvements uh, or vice versa, um, the two parties, tenants and landlords, um, how do they share uh, the benefits? Um, of the um, of both the retrofits and the cost savings, um, et cetera. And how do you create a lease that is attractive um, and benefits both parties? So um, our work 
uh, really focused around collecting samples of existing uh, green lease language, um, reviewing uh, best examples and trying to pick one as a sort of a baseline to work from, um, finding some practitioners, lawyers, uh, property owners and managers, and uh, take a look at what they're doing and share ideas and um, kind of get a more of a real world perspective on uh, the issues and how they might be addressing it. So uh, we wanted to share this baseline and hold a round table event, which we did and uh, to gain that input. And um, we wanted to uh, integrate that outcome of the discussion into some new um, language samples. And we found out some interesting things along the way. Uh, this is a list of um, all the different least language pieces that we reviewed. Um, they varied uh, from 2011 through 2016. Um, we recommend uh, to take a look at any of these um, at the end of this section of the presentation, I actually have some that are specific and actually newer that are also good resources to look at. Uh, the takeaways from looking at those um, different lease languages is that most of them mentioned uh, sub-metering, which uh, we feel is really a step in the right direction. I think, it's, uh, I think we can all agree that you have to know what you're using in the way of energy in order to um, both agree on uh, what kinds of things should be done and um, the outcomes of the efforts that you're doing. So uh, not so good. There was actually relatively little reference to energy, mainly uh, Energy Star, Portfolio Manager. Um, the, the things that were mentioned, daylighting sensors, LEDs and stuff, were pretty much outdated by the current code. And, and this work we did actually in 2016. Um, in, in general, a uh, little it'll get us to advanced energy community goals um, or allow us to address our existing building stock, which we all know is something that's um, extremely important to us. So we ended up looking, uh, using the NRDC's um, energy efficiency um, lease language, um, National Resource Defense Council um, language, um, kind of in terms of its layout, kind of what we had intended to write um, we thought that it was actually re reasonably good, but it wasn't really adopted, and we kind of wanted to understand why that was. It wasn't used more. And it also became a starter uh, discussion for the roundtable sections of it. Uh, the Green Leaf language uh, was held in, uh, roundtable was held in May of 2016. It's pretty simple, it was a facilitated discussion. Uh, we reviewed sections of the language. Uh, we had intended to go through more of that, but we started to realize that there were um, there was a lot of other feedback. So it would end up being kind of a very robust discussion. Um, we were hoping to discover some new language, promote collaboration between tenants and landlords, of course. And the discussion went on for about three and a half hours, so it was quite a long session. Um, what we learned was that there's really a lack of education on how to sell energy efficiency and renewable language in lease space situations. Um, the education is key. Um, you know, the, the folks that are negotiating leases maybe don't know as much about energy efficiency and renewable energy as they could. And if they did, they would be in a better position to um, negotiate leases and try and put this together. So there's, there's a big piece of education that's needed. Um, boilerplate language isn't necessarily the right pathway, as you can imagine. Um, just about every landlord has a different lease language that they would use. You can find lots of different um, lease, leases online, but if you look at them, they're all going to be different. And depending on what the tenant uh, tenant's goals and their uh, what their occupancy of the building would be, and what the landlord has in mind, and what they have as a starting point, is going to have a huge effect on what. So it's really not a one-size-fits-all. Um, it should provide language that benefits both parties. Um, and a modified gross lease um, or a gross lease is the um, best format for resolving the split incentive issue. Uh, the last thing which was a very big takeaway was that a letter of intent is a good starting point to uh, create the deal and the lease. And um, that applies whether it's a new tenant or an existing tenant. So in terms of uh, 
uh, letter of intent language. Um, this was uh, what we suggested, uh, both the tenant and landlord will fully participate in a meeting together to determine the energy use and management plan um, of the building. And um, that, that meeting is key. Um, it's, uh, it's the first opportunity often to put those goals out on the table, and it's important to have that on the front end, especially when you're trying to achieve zero net energy. Um, then there are different pieces, um, establishing a baseline, um, agreeing on how it will be monitored, that there'll be a third party contractor to establish energy use data and share it so that it's transparent. And, um, uh, and it will also um, identify some energy efficiency projects that have um, economic and environmental benefit for both parties. Um, guiding principles, uh, this is kind of the outcome of what we put together, um, that in general, the landlord and the tenant should uh, operate the building as efficiently as possible. Um, oftentimes, the landlord is actually in the building or occupies space in the building, and um, they just have as much responsibility as the, as the tenant as well. Um, the benefits should be shared uh, between the landlord and the tenant. Um, consumption and demand for resources measurable, transparent to both parties, and education helps both parties understand um, the benefits. So, in conclusion, um, to support a transition to energy efficiency in Zini, and uh, we really want to be looking at agreements that uh, are gross leased um, or the modified. Uh, it's preferred that the tenant and landlord share the savings and the benefits. Um, they should be shared, for example, if typically a tenant reduces a, re uh, receives a reduced monthly rental cost, the landlord will realize an increase in the property value. And those are probably the most common um, for each of those parties. Um, letter of intent um, is a good vehicle um, to, uh, to be the first piece of that transaction. And um, the meeting should take place. Um, and those uh, bulleted items are the things that really need to be um, established. Um, uh, retro commissioning also came into play. Um, you know, uh, the building will need tune-ups from time to time, and for everybody to be in agreement, uh, that's something that should be done um, every three or so years. Um, and then um, any, uh, of course, sharing the cost of savings and energy. So that was really our uh, takeaway from the, from the uh, uh, workshop that we had. And um, I believe that that takes us to some other resources that I mentioned before. Um, the Greenlease uh, Impact Potential um, on the US Department of Energy site is a great um, piece of work. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute recently came out with uh, uh, best practices for Z&E buildings. Um, that has a little bit more of the financial um, side of things. And uh, the others um, uh, are also um, good pieces. I would suggest the first two as being um, good resources. Um, I think there's room for um, putting together a uh, more simple piece that a landlord, um, building owner, uh, or property manager uh, could reference to really show what the financial benefits are. And uh, I'm probably going to do some more exploration around what the long-term financial benefits are, um, besides just increasing um, the property value after some of the savings are shared with the, uh, with the tenant. So that takes us to the next presentation, um, which is uh, building energy management system, uh, management and control systems. And I'll hand it over to Rachel Launder for that. Thanks, Kim. All right, so just as we were hearing about how the lease language helps get building owners and tenants on the same page while meeting their financial and sustainability goals, um, we learned that a, a big part of that is being able to monitor the energy use. and be able to visualize that. And the building energy management control systems is a tool that we can leverage to help us visualize all that energy data. Um, so I've been working with Kim and the Clean Coalition on, on the PAKE project, the Peninsula Advanced Energy Community Grant, um, specifically diving into the building energy management and control systems piece um, and how commercial 
building owners and operators can uh, leverage these systems to save energy, save money, make their um, commercial spaces more attractive to tenants. And so I'll not be getting into all the details of the report. Um, the report really looks at what sort of systems are out there. I have a matrix of all the, the brands that I could find um, through email, uh, emailing interviews and um, internet search. So I encourage you to check that out when that final report is published. Um, so first I want to demystify what building energy management and control systems are. The systems have had many permutations over the last decade and um, as I found, the jargon used by software developers and technology companies doesn't always help when we're wading through all the different solutions in the marketplace. And so the most streamlined definition I found comes from Navigant Research, um, and it states that building energy management and control systems or uh, building energy management systems or BEMS or energy management systems, um, all of those would work, are IT-based monitoring and control systems that tie into existing energy-related data streams of a building's infrastructure, including its HVAC and lighting systems, while providing visualization and analysis of that data to enable better energy-related decision-making. So this broad definition includes an array of systems. Some of them simply generate dashboards to show aggregated building and portfolio energy use, as you can kind of see on the far left of our graph, um, while others have more advanced capabilities and can support demand response events automate lighting and HVAC, plug loads, renewables, and electric vehicle charging. So it's really important for our building owners and energy managers to overcome challenges in identifying what the right system is for their facility um, amongst this breadth of software offerings. So as you can see, there are plenty of opportunities for growth and adoption of energy management systems in California. Um, we have 60% of market saturation in large commercial facilities, 22% saturation in medium-sized facilities, or the mere 2% saturation in small facilities. Uh, and this report comes from the California Public Utilities Commission um, and generally states that these systems are underutilized. And as a state, we can do more to advance this technology. So the business case for energy management system really depends on your facility. Um, how much energy you're using, what type of systems you already have employed, how well it's managed, and your demand charges, as well as other, other factors. Um, according to ACEEE, uh, energy management systems with predictive capabilities, as well as fault detection, can save 13 to 66% of a building's energy bill. So there's a, there's a wide range there for what it can do for, for your facility. Um, beyond reducing maintenance and equipment failure costs, energy management systems can be used to reduce demand charges, provide insight for cost-effective upgrades, um, and just again to emphasize how important these are when looking at a green lease, um, facilities that offer advanced energy monitoring, analysis, and display with an uh, energy management system can be more attractive to tenants, easier to manage, and can provide for individual tenant billing for energy costs and services. Ultimately, though, to understand this whole suite of benefits an energy management system can provide, um, it's important for you to perform an energy assessment and really look at your facility's needs. Um, so I'm really excited to have the County of San Mateo's energy manager to kind of share what the county has done, because we've run through that exercise in doing audits and researching what is out on the marketplace. So without further ado, I'll let Andy Jane introduce himself and, and share what we've been up to here. Oh, hi everyone, this is Andy. I'm the energy manager with County of San Mateo. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about our experience at County of San Mateo facilities, about implementing various um, uh, building management systems. A lot of times you call it uh, BMS, uh, building management system, or building automation system. And nowadays we call it like more comprehensive, like energy management and control system, so essentially the same thing. So uh, telling about our experience, uh, so when we started here, we had uh, different buildings, uh, different continuum, uh, some on GDC, some with very little controls, manual controls, some pneumatic, and then uh, we did some research on as to what different uh, uh, building management systems available were there 
and a lot of them are proprietary that once you got that system, you're hooked on for that company to provide far support. Uh, so we, we compared manual systems and then we chose the 3 dm Niagara. So that's a main front end or head end and uh, that's a supervisory controller or what you interact with. And the nice thing with the 3DM Niagara is it's a non uh, proprietary and it integrates with other systems like lighting security. And uh, one other thing for us, uh, the county is uh, we can specify 3DM Niagara framework, but still we can have competition uh, between different controls contractor. So we can decide who does a good price for us and who provides service. And also in future, if uh, we are not happy with one uh, contractor, we can change a contractor and still we can get services. Um, so even if one business, go, one contract goes out of business or we don't like them, so we have more choices while still keeping 3 Niagara. Uh, you know, there are systems such as, you know, Siemens, so which is top to bottom is only come one company. The same company designs, sells, service, maintain parts. So they don't have channel partners and other uh, companies that you can deal. So that's, that's why we chose 3 dm Niagara. And uh, once we standardized, uh, it became easier for our uh, facility engineers, stationary engineers to use one system. So it's easier to have a common training and then parts. Uh, that, so that's why we have used the uh, 3 dm Niagara and that's what we're trying to specify. And most of the county systems have been converted to 3 dm Niagara. And the uh, other thing that we have done is uh, uh, we have standardized on our uh, control specifications, and we we like our engineers to be very strict um, as to what we allow, what we do not allow, what our standards are, and we're trying to implement them on existing buildings and the new buildings as well. And then uh, we choose uh, sequence of operations which are very, very uh, energy efficient. These tend to be above and beyond what Title 24 requires. Uh, and uh, the benefit is uh, that you get a system which has got the graphics, uh, uh, which are easy to use, and there are trends, alerts, and alarms that you can configure, set up, uh, depending on importance and how do you want to use them. One of the aspects is, uh, no matter how good your control system specification is, you have to do a very detailed commissioning of the system. And a lot of times projects are in a rush, the project is substantially done, and everybody tries to move on to new project. Uh, so we use more uh, detailed uh, functional testing. So we ask our consulting engineers to specify a detailed commissioning scope right in the design, and the contractor knows that they are supposed to perform and demonstrate all these tests. And even if the project is done, we collect the trend data and we still uh, review it and ask control contractor to make any necessary uh, adjustment or changes. Uh, now some of the benefits and challenges of using uh, energy management control system, and some of them were on a, on a higher level, you know, already highlighted in the previous presentation, but now some of the basic things is uh, uh, it provides you a simple graphical interface. You can adjust uh, your operating hours, Monday to Friday, eight to five, just like a calendar function. And you can uh, schedule your holidays, your any special event days. Uh, this is such a simple thing, uh, which is just for the click of a mouse, you can see the most efficient equipment is one that does not run, does not run when it's not needed to run. But despite that, we still find issues that uh, somebody, you know, people forget to schedule Christmas or people will just turn it on. Um, somebody, somebody requests, hey, we're gonna be having a city council meeting or some meeting, can you please turn on the air conditioning for this evening? And people forget to turn it off. So it's an easy to use tool, uh, but we will still need to monitor uh, that you know those things are scheduled properly. And of course, uh, the benefit is it allows you to remotely monitor, control, and troubleshoot. So before we had uh, systems, where there was one computer on that one building and only you have to go to that computer to see what's going on. And if somebody calls from a five, 10 mile away or whatever building, then you have to basically drive over there. So now all the 
building management system, we have their web base. They're connected to county internet, either through DSL or countries in, in its, uh, its own servers. So it's easy to uh, troubleshoot and monitor that before you roll a truck and go to the building, we try to do some troubleshooting and then we know okay, what exact possibly is wrong, then we take the tools and uh, meters to troubleshoot the problem. And other benefit is uh, what we have done in a lot of facilities is we have connected our gas meter, electric meter, and also water meters to our building management system. And then we ask the building management system uh, to provide an energy dashboard so we can um, somewhat you know, verify what PGE &E or a water district is saying is our use the same. So we can see uh, from January 1st to December 31st or any time what was the max use, min use, average use, and we can use it for doing some monitoring if some equipment is, is running, why not schedule in the night, why day load is so night, so much more. So these dashboards are helpful, and well, now we have our own meters directly connected to our own system, so we can do sometimes pg &E, you know, they, they make a mistake, they don't read a meter, or there's a wrong, so we, we have a basis that, you know, hey, we are monitoring this as well. So our reading is there's something wrong with the meter, so the cross verification. And uh, of course, you know, uh, energy management system provides alerts and alarms, and you can set them up for performance monitoring as well as maintenance. Uh, simply saying if a pump has run for, say, 1,500 hours, just send an alarm or alert that, hey, go ahead, do the maintenance. So those pop-ups and other features help out in uh, in not missing things. Uh, other thing that we have done is, uh, so we have, uh, we're trying to, on few buildings, we have done the integration of the lighting control system. On the same, for example, in County Homes Building 2, we have the solar panels connected to the, and the lighting on the same system. And at our medical center, we're connecting the cogen and the solar. Sometimes these things are directly connected to hardwired. A lot of times these are all web-based, so we just have a plug-in or on a, on a common screen, uh, you can see a lot of these uh, uh, other systems as well. And, uh, okay, and then, you know, of course, there are other benefits about demand response. One key important thing is that, you know, we have to have uh, staff very well trained. Uh, this is a quick example. For example, uh, this one is Hall of Justice. In 2012, we did a project. There were more things done besides controls, like the boilers were replaced, the uh, economizer dampers were replaced, an entire HVAC pneumatic control system was upgraded from Robert Shaw to 3 dm Niagara. And the numbers over here show amazing results, like electric use went down to 13%, gas use down by 82%, greenhouse gas emissions and the utility costs, all of them went down. And the Energy Star score improved that we got the Energy Star certification through our plot. Uh, so it's a, it's a good recognition of what we have done. And uh, this other example that we have is County Office Building 2. It was not too bad. It was already a DDC control system, still a DDC. But then we didn't have the support or the parts were not available. Uh, and then we implemented modern sequence of operation. This one again shows here that there were good savings realized. Uh, uh, around 7 year payback, and again, Energy Star score improved, and some of the, uh, you know, basic uh, features of our graphics and trends and reports, and other slides show, just to show you, uh, this one shows your electric savings and gas savings before the project, after the project, up above is before, lower is, you know, post retrofit, so the numbers really improved. Uh, this is just a screenshot to show, like, you know, what a floor plan looks like, like what the like, different zones and different VAVs, what the temperature you want to have, what exactly it is, and you click into it, you can go deep inside the zones. Um, these are, again, uh, more screenshots that show very nicely, pictorially, in 3D shown, what the different systems are and uh, what the trends are. So those things help out in monitoring and troubleshooting. Uh, so basically, you know, what's next? Uh, we have done uh, this work so far. Uh, what, what we plan to do is um, we, we try to use some of the web-based services. There are certain companies uh, that, you know, go deep inside your uh, building management system, and for a service, uh, they give you a report. 
and depending on how detailed report you want, how much more support you want for a monthly fee, they tell us a report, hey, mail building, these are three, four things wrong, and you can fix them. Right now, the staff, the facility people are so burdened already that although the features are there, it's difficult for them to use. And same, you know, there are energy monitoring dashboards that provide easier to use uh, uh, reports and analysis, and you can schedule that the first of the month, send this, generate this report, send it to so many people. Uh, other thing uh, that we're try, we are thinking about doing is integrating the building management system with the uh, CMMS, uh, like, you know, maintenance systems, so we can track what the preventive maintenance service orders are with the, what the energy uh, management control systems are, are there. So those are the next steps that we want to work on. I guess that's all from my side. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I can turn it back to the Clean Coalition. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Rachel and Kim, uh, for your presentations. Very informative. Uh, we're going to get right to Ann Edminster from Design Avenues, and she's waiting in the wings. Ann, you are next. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We would not have advanced energy communities without homes. So I'm going to talk about homes and a little bit about my background. I'm a green building consultant. I've been immersed in that world for the better part of a quarter century and for uh, almost 10 years immersed in zero net energy. And uh, that is increasingly morphing into zero carbon communities. So that's a little bit about what I do and I engage with all manner of different parties in this ecosystem from individual homeowners to um, national and international institutions um, in the scope of my work. So uh, consulting and research and all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, both new and existing homes for advanced energy communities today with uh, an emphasis on existing um, because we have more of those, but also a little bit look at new. So here's a very quick overview of the topics I'll be covering and moving right into the first of those topics, the challenge with existing homes. So first of all, I think it's worth talking about what is a an advanced energy community home look like? Uh, in our ideal vision of that, it's a highly efficient all electric home in all probability, it also has its own solar array. No more gas appliances, I think, is a really um, an emerging and very important theme for advanced energy communities. And this is because we really can only have an advanced or a clean energy future if we stop burning fossil fuels and get rid of those emissions. So increasingly, we are talking to all kinds of institutions who have an influence over choice of fuel selection and institutions and individuals. Um, individual homeowners can be very, very attached to certain gas appliances, typically don't care how their home is heated or cooled don't care how their water is heated, they just want it hot, don't care too much about how their clothes get dry, or rather what fuel is used for those purposes. However, a lot of people do care about the way they cook and have had bad experiences in the past with old style electric stoves. So one of our challenges in this arena is uh, really, sharing a lot of information about induction cooktops, which are the latest, greatest answer to how we cook with electricity or otherwise. Um, it's, a, it's a tough battle to really reach people on this one because so many of our decisions about homes are very gut-based. And when people have had a past experience that is negative, even if you say, oh, but this is a new technology, it can be very, very difficult to overcome that prejudice about gas 
cooking versus electric cooking. So this is a real challenge for us. And then some people are also very attached to the notion of fireplaces. And these days, of course, because of air quality regulations, more of the um, fireplaces that would be installed in new homes tend to be gas-based, not wood burning, because there's there are real challenges there. So um, there, of course, we have air quality impacts, adverse impacts from fireplaces in homes, even gas fireplaces. So there are very good reasons not to install them. Nevertheless, this is an emotional barrier to overcome. So a bit more about the more technical pieces. As I mentioned, photovoltaics are not inevitably, but very likely components to many advanced energy homes. Along with that, batteries for load balancing. It, when we started looking at zero net energy, uh, again, a decade or so ago, that sounded like a really magical, it was a very captivating concept, a home that would produce as much energy as it used on an annual basis. The rub is that meeting those needs on an annual basis create some imbalances on an hour to hour, day to day, season to season basis. So we can have lots of energy production, not necessarily at the times we need it, and conversely, not nearly enough energy at times, for example, when the sun isn't shining at night. We still need to cook and have lights and run many electronics and appliances and so forth. So. In California in particular, as the state has gotten farther down its path of pursuing advanced energy in homes, communities, and throughout society, we have realized progressively that we need to match production capacity with storage capacity. And then finally, it's increasingly likely that we will have electric vehicles as part of the equation. So, um, retrofitting existing homes to meet those criteria, match that definition, does represent a number of hurdles. First of all, financial, um, replacing things that we already have or adding things to what we already have represent investment. And particularly, if we're not replacing something that's actually broken or reached the end of its useful life, it's quite unpalatable to face making those replacements. And then there's also this question of timing. Typically, we don't have things break down all at once, unless, of course, it's a major holiday and you have 20 people coming for a holiday dinner. Then you might have multiple things breaking down at once, but that's not typically the picture. And so replacing things piecemeal tends to be much more costly than replacing things when we can do something as part of a larger project that's more systematically planned. We also have issues of having to go too many different places to solve our problems. If you have a different place you're gonna to go to buy your appliances versus having to go to a plumber and or an electrician for certain types of replacements and retrofits. And then there are general contractors, you know, roofers, PV installers, it's all over the map, and that's a lot of management, and most homeowners are um, ill-equipped to manage those negotiations and installation procedures, let alone the actual processes of retrofitting themselves. And then, of course, it's all extraordinarily disruptive. So that makes it the whole proposition very unappealing for folks. So this is the setup, and um, we don't yet have really excellent solutions everywhere. However, in the Netherlands, they have taken a remarkably creative approach to solving this. And rather than me telling you the story, I'm going to play you this two-minute video that describes how this was approached in the Netherlands. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that. Worldwide, we use and waste a lot of energy, much of which is used in our homes. At the same time, we pay high en energy bills in order to live in houses that are actually often uncomfortable because of humidity, mold and drafts. 
What can we do about this? The Dutch initiative Energy Sprong has come up with an idea. The team at Energy Sprong have developed a method to transform existing houses into net zero energy houses. Net zero energy means that the house generates as much energy as it needs for heating, hot water, lights, and household appliances, resulting in a warm and comfortable home. This is made possible by the use of new technologies such as prefabricated facades, new smart heating and cooling installations, and insulated rooftops equipped with solar panels. People don't even have to leave their homes because the transformation is completed within one week. After a net zero energy makeover, the house looks bright and modern from the outside and no longer has moisture or drafts inside. This makeover comes with a 30 year warranty on both the energy and indoor climate performance. This all sounds great, but who's going to pay for it? The principle is, the money that you'd normally spend on your energy bills, combined with reduced repairs and maintenance costs, pays for the renovation. So you get a makeover for your house without any additional costs. Hundreds of people in the Netherlands already enjoy more comfortable living conditions following their successful net zero energy makeovers. And new makeovers are taking place every day. So how did the Dutch do it? In order to implement this change, an initial group of social housing associations joined forces to secure a first market for these performance-based makeovers. Furthermore, adjustments in government regulation were in. These included allowing social housing associations to charge tenants an energy service fee in return for providing them with a net zero energy house. At the same time, an evaluation of the new refurbishments was undertaken by banks in order to provide affordable financing to the social housing associations. The independent market development team at Energy Sprong coordinated all these activities to ensure each of the required market conditions will be fulfilled at the same time. Together, this creates the right market conditions for innovative companies that want to invest in and develop these net zero energy makeovers. These are all based on prefabrication and industrialization, allowing performance to be driven up and costs down. To learn more, go to energysprong.eu. Okay, so that's way more entertaining, listen to me. <laughs> but let me recap the four tactics that are at the core of Energy Sprung's strategy. Um, first of all, they realized that they needed to aggregate demand in volume in order to make all the other pieces come together because of the economies of scale that are achievable with the volume. That enabled them to attract a number of partners who were capable of implementing this industrial approach. And the industrial approach is important to address the disruption factor. So with otherwise, when we do things the way we normally do in a very craft-oriented fashion, an individual home retrofit can take three, four, five, six months easily. And that's when nothing goes haywire. So reducing the amount of time is a crucial piece to reducing the human resistance to having their lives disrupted. And it's also a crucial piece of bringing the cost down. So their, um, the volume piece was also important in terms of identifying a bunch of housing stock that had very common characteristics so that the solutions that were deployed also had those common characteristics. Not 100% uniform, but uh, so there's a mass production that's still relatively customizable through um, on-site measurements that are transmitted to the factory and um, computer-aided uh, drafting and cutting and so forth all goes into this. And then, Finally, the finance mechanisms and the regulatory barriers also had to be addressed at the same time. They realized that if they waited for each one of these issues to be unraveled by itself, 
they were so interdependent that that really was not going to occur. So they said, okay, we're going to really deal with all of these things at once. Now, it did help that in the Netherlands, this project was really initiated out of the public sector. So the regulatory piece was uh, perhaps more easily addressed there than it might be in another context. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, really important approach. So now that project has been so successful with many, many thousands of units completed at this stage. And by the way, they've even reduced the turnaround time on some of these renovations from a week to a single day. Um, what they don't mention in the video is they've also incorporated kitchen and bath retrofits. So creating a package that was attractive to the residents, not only for energy and comfort reasons, but also for other more aesthetic and lifestyle driven reasons was a central piece of their approach. So this program is now being adapted in the UK, France, Germany, Canada, and the United States. So I've shown on the map where some of these initiatives are happening in North America. Very exciting to see them going forward. So for our more ordinary needs, I think we have an opportunity to really adapt some of the same components in creating solutions more locally looking at the financing piece we have a model called pay as you save and in essence what energy sprung has done is based on the same principle so we're recovering the monthly savings from energy improvements and those are going into the cost of the improvements understanding that timing is a critical piece so we really should be looking at what is aging out in our existing homes and ideally multiple things at once or things that are on the near horizon uh, we tend to wait until things actually fail but i think we could be a little more um, clever in anticipating when things are likely to fail by looking at lifespans of appliances um, I had a dishwasher die not terribly long ago, and my husband was all set to call the repair company. And I said, well, let's just wait. Let me research how long dishwashers are likely to live and figure out when we bought that. Well, it turned out that the average lifespan of a dishwasher was something like eight years, and the dishwasher was, well, surprisingly, about eight years old. So we bought a new one rather than investing in the repair. And I think that was a, a good decision. Also, I think we need to look at solutions that involve solution providers who can really facilitate more of the processes that homeowners need to undertake if we're going to make this palatable for them. And similarly, figure out how to minimize disruption because this is a really major factor. And again, incorporating improvements that address the values of the homeowners, not simply meeting our energy goals, but looking at the wider spectrum of issues from the resident perspective. Some of that is starting to happen right now in Sonoma County um, as they are facing a lot of rebuilding. The um, Consortium of Sonoma Clean Power, PG&E, and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District have put together, together a coordinated package of incentives for the residents to rebuild in a more efficient way. The baseline incentive package is $7,500. and That incorporates a home that is 20% above the current energy code, has electric available, for the key appliances, the cooking, water heating, and dryer, allows the roof to be designed for a later solar array, um, and Sonoma Clean Power will provide an electric vehicle charger in addition to the cash incentive. On top of that, they're saying for $5,000 more if you go all electric, and a bonus of $5,000 on top of either tier with the addition of a solar array and a battery storage. 
So let's look at some of the benefits of that approach. A tier two, the all electric home, that above code home represents lower utility bills, improved comfort, and of course, insulation from rising energy costs, all electric end uses. I think this is a, a really important part of the conversation because as I mentioned earlier, the emotional attachments to some of these decisions can be our largest hurdle. So gas cooking in particular represents a number of risks, air quality risks, respiratory health concerns that go along with those. Induction cooktops have almost zero risk of burns, um, which are of particular concern in any household with children, elderly, much better cleanup, and um, of course, of great concern to those communities, reduce risk from natural gas flaring post earthquakes and in fire events, uh, as well as the obvious of contributing to the state's climate goals. So roof design for future solar array, we have some obvious benefits of invest a little bit now, save quite a bit more later. Similarly, um, with the EV charging station, then you're set up, it's a free piece of equipment for driving a clean energy vehicle, which by the way, are quite a bit cheaper to run once you have them, um, and solar similar arguments there, as well as the fact that the federal tax credit is diminishing over time. So running through this very rapidly, I know we have a short time span, and then looking at um, battery storage as well. I talked also about the load balancing benefits to the state and the grid from a homeowner perspective, this allows you to store cheap energy during peak production from the solar array and then utilizing that cheap energy later for your charging needs. And then the final option in lieu of PVs or battery storage, um, there is the alternative of buying a 20 year contract for the 100% clean energy options via the utilities. So this is a great setup for an advanced energy community in that it allows the participation, for example, in a community microgrid with the addition of some additional smart controls. This contributes to local resiliency and this community microgrid model really is a where we're headed, I believe, for our advanced energy communities. It allows for uh, providing power for critical services in the event of a power outage, allows for more local control and um, sharing of resources within a given area. So that was the express version of advanced energy homes in advanced energy communities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anne, very much. So we're gonna go right into the uh, Q&A section. We, we, we're, we're running short on time, but I think we can squeeze a couple in. Um, so this one is for you, Anne, since you just presented. Um, this comes from Gil Friend from the city of Palo Alto. How can, he asks, how can cities and counties accelerate retrofit, accelerate retrofit or upgrade of existing homes, given that we cannot require it? Uh. Gil, you wouldn't give me an easy one, would you? Um, great question. I think really looking at opportunities to replicate the energy sprung model, are these are our best options. And I think working with, we have some opportunities with big data. I have a colleague in Southern California who's done some very interesting data mining for Southern California Edison to look at possible triggers for better predicting when homeowners are riper targets for retrofit um, packages. And I think we can get quite a bit smarter by mining that data. Happy to put you in touch with them. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim, are you still with us? Uh, we have a question for you. Still am here, yes. Great. This comes from John Bolduck from the Cambridge Community Development Department. He asks, when you indicate modified gross lease is the preferred way to go, 
who do you suggest pay for the utilities? Well, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think um, the modified gross lease allows you to switch it to the tenant. Um, generally, a gross lease means that the uh, landlord is paying the utilities. So, um, you know, one form or another of the gross lease. It just I think it really just depends on um, what the situation is uh, with the tenant and what they're doing in the building and um, what the landlord goals are. Um, both of them will give you an opportunity to share the savings, um, but I think um, the gross lease is probably the better one in terms of control, but modified is also usable. Great, thank you, Kim. And uh, Andy, uh, are you still with us? We have one for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Ariel Carpenter from the city of San Jose asks, or she states uh, first, Andy Jane's ROI info is awesome. And, and Ariel asks, Andy, do you have any anecdotal info on how you made the case for these projects or any shareable resources to that end? Okay, one, well, you know, when we did the HOJ project, back then we had some EECBG grant money. Uh, so we had some federal stimulus money, uh, but even otherwise, uh, what I do is I talk to our facility engineers and I ask them to make loud noise that, you know, if you give us money or, you know, the things are beyond use, or we do not have support available. Uh, and we have, we are a very well-funded county as well. I just did not have to do too much thinking about creative financing and all. We are constantly improving our facility uh, systems and equipment. We have FICUS program. We will look at the age of the equipment. And generally, we are able to get funding for that. So... Getting funding was not difficult, uh, but then you were just doing the project has its own issues and what you plan that this should be, looks like it should be done in a couple of months and really ends up happening in, in I think a year or year. Uh, but financing for us was not that difficult. Great, thank you, Andy. Uh, Anne, we, we do have a follow-up from Gil. He's asking, what would it take to replicate this and what barriers exist? <laughs> um, well, I would definitely suggest talking to NYSERDA because of the North American <coughs> groups that are working on this, they are the farthest along. So they probably can share the most insights into what it takes. Obviously, it's, it takes an institutional commitment first and foremost, and in the absence of a progressive federal government committed to the process, um, I think, you know, you and I both know that the most activity, the most impetus for work in this arena right now is at the municipal level. So I think it falls upon the municipalities to figure out how to garner the resources to create a program like this and perhaps through a consortium such as the carbon neutral cities alliance um, which has had a role by the way in instigating these energy sprung um, offspring so i think it's it's really looking to those philanthropic sources that have fueled the earlier efforts towards reproducing these uh, once again Thank you, Ann. Uh, we've got one more question to ask uh, since we are now at the uh, one o'clock mark. Uh, Kim, this one is for you, and this will be the final question of the webinar. Uh, do you expect these solutions will be easier to do in a single family home rental or a multifamily rental building? Uh, does it apply to both? This is from James Talea from Home Energy Analytics. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's a good question. I think it's probably, you know, more commercial, so multifamily, larger multifamily kind of circumstances. Um, I'm, you know, I think we were kind of more focused on the, you know, larger commercial as-built um, environment and, you know, what are the approaches and, and the folks that were in the room when we were having a discussion were also with, um, you know, larger um, commercial um, facilities. So I, I didn't really clarify that, but I think I'm, I'm talking more of the larger commercial. No, that's perfect. And uh, Kim, Andy, Rachel, 
and I thank you all for presenting today's webinar. Um, and everyone who attended, thank you for joining us once again. Um, there will be more webinars coming up. Uh, we will email them to you, uh, that information, in the coming days and weeks. Uh, alternatively, you can go to our website, uh, go to News and Events, and then click on Upcoming Events, and that's where we put our upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, so look out for the recording and a copy of today's presentations. They will be in one file that you can view or download. Uh, those will be coming uh, by the end of this week. So thanks very much, everybody, and have yourself a very good day.